I'm a singer, a songwriter, and a music producer. I travel around the world with my music, but Singapore is where I call home. It's a small place, but there's so much for me to learn about this tiny island and all it has to offer. We live in a lush city, but most Singaporeans are urbanites through and through. Our link to the land has weakened over time because the landscape keeps changing. So there are memories and heritage hidden in nature that most of us have forgotten. I want to reclaim those stories. To do that, I'll walk through the heritage Mother Nature holds. So this is your mysterious place. Yes! Keppel Hill Reservoir. Explore a traditional livelihood. Oh, species. And meet with an artist recording the sounds of the wild. I think they formed a mosh pit around your microphone. I'm at Keppel Hill. Most people coming to this area are probably headed there, to Sentosa. But I'm going somewhere a lot less touristy, to all that greenery. This is a hill of many names over many centuries. It was Teluk Belanga Hill when Sangnila Utama arrived in 1299 and it became Mount Faber in 1845 in honour of Captain Charles Edward Faber. Then, when the nearby harbour took on the name Keppel in 1900, so did the hill. Spanning 34 hectares, what secrets does this Keppel Hill hold exactly? Adventurous Sunny Rose will share them with me today. So why are we at this random car park? This is where Keppel Harbour was during the era of the British colonial. The car park itself was actually a worker's dormitory. The dormitory was on the left. So the ocean would have been like yes. just, just, just behind across, this? Yes, within 100 metres away, you will be surprised to know the hidden part of Keppel Hill, the hidden reservoir, Japanese tomb, and especially the World War II bunker. Let's go uncover some hidden gems. Yes, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> When did you start exploring the wilder areas of Singapore? I started off 10 years back. I was raised as a kampung boy. So the environment actually um, gave me the, the energy. Oh, you see? The, the water is so clean. So fresh. <laughs> in fact, you can take a shower if you, <laughs> if you are in the hot weather. You see the stream? Don't watch me shower. OK, Daniel. What do you see now? A Something. hole in the wall. Before we go inside, we need uh, to shine a bit to see whether there's any frogs, which actually will attract snakes. We also don't want to be a food for the snake. <laughs> okay, let's take a look inside, yeah? All right. Okay, let's go. Over your head, eh? Careful. All right. Let's go. You're going first? Yeah, yeah, you just come down. All right. Woohoo. Woohoo. Well, Daniel, you are in Siaim Bunker. There are different theories about what this bunker was used for. Some say it was for prisoners of war during World War II. Others say ammunition storage. Sunny Rose and some heritage enthusiasts believe otherwise. If you look at the structure, it built in a way that is to, to accumulate easily 50 person inside. Tentatively, I can say it's an area shelter for careful harbour uh, workers. Being in the bunker reminded me that Singapore's history is short but very rich. When I was there, in the dark, it felt kind of eerie. The reason these places exist is because of bombs, wartime, hardship. But it makes me want to see more. The Red Hill there, they got one uh, ABC market. Stand for Alexandra Brickworks Company. So this red bricks is actually from Brickworks. There's a frog. There's a frog, that means there's a snake. There's a snake, that means there's no me. Bye-bye. <laughs> I'm out. I'm out. OK, we're out. Woohoo! <laughs> we walk for another 20 minutes because Sunny Rose promises something amazing right ahead. <laughs> so this is your mysterious place? Yes! 
Keppel Hill Reservoir. Built in 1905 to service a small hospital in the area, it was abandoned after a serious malaria outbreak. But not for long. British troops stationed nearby soon found another use for it. The regiment from the Gilliman Barrack staff converted it into swimming pool for the military personnel. If you look closely, you will find a diving platform. The metal piece here is actually a supporting bracket for the diving board. This seems like a really fun place. Why would they just stop using it? Unfortunately, there's two uh, personnel drowned while doing a swim here. After the incident, the military personnel was not allowed to do any swimming. This is white dove. You believe things I, I learned in the forest. Well. See, this, this is why you are meant to be out in nature, <laughs> but I'm meant to be in a music studio. So I can do. <laughs> when you walked in, I smelled something very unfamiliar. You said it was just fresh air. Even in the parks that are closer to the city, you don't get this, where it's just green all around you, fresh oxygen. <laughs> Behind this wall, something interesting. <laughs> Let's go. It's so huge. Climb up a bit of these uh, rocks. Why is there a staircase in the middle of a forest? <sighs> Hate stairs. This is what I want to show to you. Is this like a memorial? Yeah, this is a Japanese tomb. This tomb belonged to Komoto Igasa. He came to Singapore to work in 1940s with Mitsubishi shipping industry. And unfortunately, he died in a younger age, at 47 years old. I did not expect a Japanese tomb in the middle of a forest like this. Last thing I would expect. Why is Komoto buried here instead of the Japanese cemetery in Haugang? And what did he achieve in order to warrant such a significant burial space? The answers remain unknown, even today. You might have to overcome a few obstacles, get a little bit dirty, get a little bit sweaty. Are we there yet? Uh, soon, 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 soon. <laughs> but trust me, it's worth it. If you put in the work to find out more about our heritage and nature, it's very, very really full view. You won't be disappointed. See, now I know the hike was worth it for this view. Try it out. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing me, man. From the jungle to the ocean, I learn about a method of fishing that has been generations in the making. <laughs> That's right. I'm the lucky charm. Did you know that Singapore is surrounded by about 64 islands? And for generations, many lived in southern islands like Pulau Seking and Pulau Sudong, making a living from fishing. When these southern islanders moved here to the mainland, what happened to their way of living? Back then, bubu fishing was their livelihood. Some of them, like Uncle Hamza, are still holding on to this tradition today. Bubu means cage, and he makes these by hand. How did you start bubu fishing? I started bubu fishing in almost 7 tahun itulah saya belajar daripada bapa saya. Tengok okay, tadi kan zaman bapa saya pun dia belajar lagi datuk saya juga lah. Sikit-sikit lah saya belajar ke sini umur saya sudah 20 tahun baru saya sendiri buat lah. So how do the fish actually get caught inside this? Kita taruh ni macam ikan lagi sini masuk ah macam gini kan. Ada masuk nanti dah punya kawan tengok wah saya punya kawan sudah dalam kita pun masuklah. Ah masuk tapi keluar. Ah ni. There are about 10 bubu fishermen based here at the West Coast Boatel and every one of them makes their cages differently. So how do you design this cage? Yeah, saya punya style macam gini lah. 
Dan semua semacam gini, hook, hook, hook. Mana tiga hook, saya punya. Lagipun ini tak sampai sini, ah, ini saya punya. Ini saya punya pesen macam gini lah, rendah. This is Uncle Hamza's special style. The waves are rough today, so Uncle Hamza is working with his brother, Ahmad. We're going to check if the catch of the day has come in. Today, the water visibility pretty low, and all this doesn't really sound like a good recipe for fish. No luck here, so we're going to try another spot instead. Uncle Hamza has about 20 booboo -boo cages out here at sea, and he knows exactly where they are based on landmarks like this beacon. The booboo -boo cages are secured to the ocean floor with huge rocks. Oh, this is the booboo. -boo. Yes, this is Uncle Hamza's booboo -boo for sure. Oh, oh, splash, splash, splash. Oh, it's a lot of fish. Jumping around, ah. Born in 1955, Uncle Hamza grew up on Pulau Sudong, an island off Singapore's southern coast. Most of its inhabitants back then made a living off the sea. Mini, nama ikan dingkis. Ini satu kilo, berapa besar sampai 18. Ini ikan peledi, ini satu kilo, kadang yang besar sampai 7 dolar. So from these two bubus, how much could you earn from this? Ah, ini kalau betul ikan dia, mau dekat 100 kalau 80 tu boleh dapat lah. Ah, macam minyak hari, mungkin awak pergi, ada luck juga lah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, I'm the lucky charm. <laughs> These guys are more than twice my age. Uncle Hamza is 67, and he's just jumping in and out of the water. He has so much energy. I'm sitting here watching them, and I'm feeling tired. Now that Uncle Hamza is retired, booboo -boo fishing has become a full-time pursuit. Oh, saya kalau pergi laut memang memang saya suka memang lah. All right. After a hard day's work, <laughs> we've got a lot of fish. When he is not fishing, Uncle Hamza spends most of his time making new booboo -boo cages. They have to be replaced every three to four months. And I'm getting a free lesson. It's pretty difficult because these corners are like barbed wire. And I'm very scared of hurting myself. <laughs> Uncle Hamza is laughing at me because I'm not doing a good job. potong-potong. <laughs> These traps are built from scratch with such care and precision. These are the hands of a hard-working man compared to mine. It's sad that this is a dying art and so few people who know how to do this are left because this is a part of our heritage that's going to be lost at sea. Uncle Hamza hopes to keep the tradition alive by passing his knowledge on to his two sons. Nanti orang cakap, ah, kenapa engkau punya bapa tahu, engkau tak tahu. Kan? Hamza dah tahu pasal saya sendiri belajar sama saya punya bapa. Ha, kan? ha, lagi datuk saya, tuan bapa, tuan saya. Ha. <laughs> My foray into nature continues, this time by collecting sounds. It's time to find out what language do fish speak. Mm. 
When out in nature, we are often told to stop and smell the roses. But have you tried taking the time to pause and listen to the sounds of nature around you? I'm meeting a sound artist who has been doing this for more than 20 years. Zul collects the sounds and songs of nature in order to create art. For me, this place is uh, quite interesting because some of the sounds are very unpredictable. Uh, and also, I like the nature. So it's just basically like going there to take a moment from city life and also absorb with the sound and environment in the space. Okay, here are some of the equipments. I see shotgun mics. I have two of them. My DIY mics. So I build it from scratch. I just buy the capsule of the mic, soldered everything. What kind of sound does this mic have? It's like just pick up like the, the ambience of the, the sound. I want to show you is a it's underwater mic, or it's called the hydrophone. It kind of looks like a stethoscope. Yes. <laughs> You're a strong man. Yeah. <laughs> we are now ready to explore Sungai Bulong, one of Zul's favorite haunts. This 202 hectare sized park has rivers, ponds, mangroves, and forests all with lots of audio possibilities. Okay, looks like a perfect spot for underwater recording here. A lot of fishes. Sure. Yep. Okay, let's do that. I have two underwater mic. Both have different characteristics, right? Is it going to be a lot of bloop, 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 bloop? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard an underwater recording in my life. Okay, now that all set, we're good to go. It's time to find out what language do fish speak. I'm hearing a lot of duh, duh. I came to touch it, say hello. I think they formed a mosh pit around your microphone. If you think about it, the sounds of nature are a part of our natural heritage. Instead of taking photos, maybe we should try capturing memories of space and time through what they sound like. OK, Dennis, here looks like a great spot for land recording. So let me set up. I have five mics. Where you want to record the sound? I think we can get like that 360 kind of sound. Get it a little bit higher up. Make sure you can hear those birds around here. Get some of the nature noise. Now we are all set up. So be nature sounds, but I hear a lot of boats and industrial machine noises here. But we have a mix of both worlds, the nature sound and also the city sound. OK, Daniel, you want to listen. I think you can really hear like 360 degrees. I can hear the water coming in, like wave by wave. You can hear yeah. that detail. I hear a lot of birds. I think they're crows. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can hear even like leaves falling down. You can hear that. It's really cool. This is a very different way of experiencing nature for me because I live my life through sound and today that sense has been heightened. Zul's field recordings are sound sketches, audio pieces that he gathers in order to create sound art. He has invited me to his studio to do some composing. You've kind of unintentionally become one of Singapore's keepers of its sound. Because the, the places change, right? And that's definitely the sound will change. I mean, it really helps to capture a little bit of Singapore's history. Yes. <laughs> Before I start a particular project, I will pen down all my ideas into the sketchbook. Maybe you want to pen down emotions or what you want to achieve. With my artistic ability, trust me, no one else is going to understand besides me. <laughs> We have a kind of a storyline, a journey, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's try it. Yeah? Fish lab. <laughs> yes. Oh, I like that song. So maybe let's try put an effects to see how it goes. Uh... OK. 
can I add some instruments to it as well? Sure. I see you have a MIDI keyboard there. Yes, <laughs> why not? Let's do it. Alright, it's coming along, but we need... Angry fish. Angry fish. <laughs> Almost there. There we go. I think that's a nice only angry fish. Alright. I'm liking it. Are you feeling it? I'm feeling it. Two hours later. Alright. Are you ready for the final product? I was very impressed. I think when you lay it to them, it enriched all this different detail. For me, it was a fresh new experience. I wanted a little bit of mystery, a little bit of intrigue, because I remember when I was there, I was so curious about all the sounds, all the sights. Yeah, it's, a, it's more like a, a lot of discovery in this, in this journey. All right. I work a lot with audio, but I've never done a field recording like this. I tried to create a piece that captured the excitement, the adventure. Every time I listen to this piece, I'm going to be transported back in time to my memory of Sungai Bolo. Our heritage has hidden history and traditions that survive. So we are out of Clementine Forest. This is the real corridor. And what has been left behind changes. Tentatively, I can say it's an arid shelter for careful harbour workers. Some of these places feel like an open museum. Approximately about 2,000 tiles here. Where the richness of our past can be seen, heard and touched. These are the pretty iconic ones, right? These are Vanda Miss Jokim. Before this, I knew very little of our roots in nature. Now, I really hope more people get to experience what I did. <laughs>